So uh, I'm Bradley Kuhn, one of the co-organizers. Tom Marvel in the back, uh, the main organizer of this track who does all the work. Uh, this is Richard Fontana, one of the organizers, and Karen Sandler, who's on the panel, one of the organizers. And with that, I'll head it over to the moderator, who will tell you what this is about, Amanda Brock. Thank you. Thanks, Bradley. Um, can you guys hear me? Because I'm quite quiet and quite short, so I'm standing up and I'm hoping you can hear me at the back. Yeah? No? Yeah? Ish? Okay, I'll try and be louder. Does that help? So um, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm ex-GC at Canonical. I was five years working with Canonical on Ubuntu and I now work as a lawyer in private practice in the UK, mainly doing open source advice, whether for companies that aren't really open source or open source companies. I have three other people today with me in the panel. Karen Sandler, who's executive director at the Gnome Foundation and used to be GC at SFLC in New York. John Sullivan, ex-executive director at FSF. And Jeremiah Foster, who's community outreach at the Geneva Foundation, Automotive Foundation for Infotainment Systems. And I'm really glad that the room is so full because this session is not really going to be about us talking to you, but us looking for your feedback and discussion. So it's going to be a bit more of a round table than maybe you expected. So I'm glad there's a lot of you to contribute. Um, what we have been participating in, some of us anyway, through an organization called the European Legal Network. Bit of a misnomer because the European Legal Network is just a network of lawyers who work in force globally. Um, covers people from Asia to Australia. And we've set up a special interest group looking at security critical applications and how FOSS fits into that picture. Um, the, the group, the special interest group is vendor neutral, it's international, and it's looking to produce some white papers over the next few months. And the white papers will be aimed at a mixture of lawyers, policy makers, developers, and people in the, the automotive industry and medical sectors. Uh, other areas where secu security critical applications um, have profile or importance. And what we would like to achieve, which is why I proposed this session, is to get some development community involvement to make sure that the solutions that we're suggesting as lawyers actually work. Because what I've found when I've dealt with companies that have uh, security issues is that they often have lawyers who have no clue at all about FOSS. So their natural reaction is often to say no to anything that's proposed to them, which is a bit of a pain. And then stage two is asking them what it is they're really concerned about. And they'll, they'll wave around terms like product liability, um, data privacy. They might even say strict liability. But then when you ask them to reference the statutes that they're concerned about, they don't give you anything. So what we're hoping is to be very collaborative, to work in a mixture of a development community, legal community and any other interested parties and to get as much information together as we can. Um, there isn't a URL or anything I can give you, but if anybody at the end of this still is interested and wants to participate, if you can either identify yourselves to me before you leave or I guess maybe Richard, the, some, the, the, we can put a, a contact up on the... At the website or something afterwards? Can we do that? Yeah. Because um, we don't have slides and if we feel afterwards that you needed something in slides that we haven't given you, we'll also put slides together. So I've said more than enough and I'm going to pass you over to Karen Sandler. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up too, I think, because it's kind of weird sitting down. Like We're low, aren't we? Yeah, we're really low. Um, I am the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. This area is like the weird intersection of my, uh, my professional and my personal life. Um, I am a patient with a medical condition and I have an implanted pacemaker defibrillator so I literally have proprietary software connected and screwed into my heart um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit odd and um, as a lawyer in free software and then um, and as a software freedom advocate and now as the executive director of the GNOME Foundation um, having that experience has made me extremely passionate in my advocacy and I think it's incredibly important and it also gives me a way of talking about software freedom that is I think a little bit unique because when I get up in front of a group of people and I say uh, I have a big heart and I, uh, I am uh, very likely to suddenly die it makes people sort of think about their software in a different way when you say my life relies on my software and when I get people to think about the software on medical devices, then they start thinking, I can say, well, what about, um, you know, 
cars and what about voting machines and what about all of the society and life critical functionality and you know and a lot of the issues related to all of these things are united which is why we're all here on this panel um, I confess I did not actually know about the SIG until this panel so uh, I haven't been involved in that at all um, so uh, so the you know the views represented there are, not, are I think only half the panel has participated in that so far um, so I just wanted to be a little bit clear about yeah. that. What and else we're not I even at a stage where we have views, we're just trying to work out what the issues are and looking for some help to do that. So I find that a lot of the issues related to the area of medical devices are, um, are common to these other areas of safety critical devices and I look forward to discussing them more. Uh, I stand up but I wanted to look at my screen for a minute so I'll stay here. <laughs> um, so I'm the Executive Director at the Free Software Foundation and um, you know, I will shock and surprise you by saying that we think that our copyleft licenses are excellent um, in contexts that have safety and security concerns. Uh, we think that copyleft is an important policy to follow there, just as in um, other software contexts. And the place where that tends to get brought up the most in uh, devices that can cause people harm and, and cause lots of damage is in the question of whether users should be able to modify the software on the device themselves and install a new version. Um, and that's, it's kind of a funny question if you think about where it comes from because um, especially if it's in a case where you have, let's say, a car manufacturer that wants to use free software in the car themselves. They want to ship, for example, the kernel Linux on a car computer system, but then they want to stop the user from modifying it because that might be dangerous. Well, they want to use the kernel because the kernel is awesome. How did the kernel get to be awesome? The kernel got to be awesome by lots of people, anybody, being able to modify it and contribute improvements. So it's sort of like we've enabled the freedom to modify in order to build the software, which we can now use in cars, and that's awesome, but we're now going to kick the ladder away while we're still standing on it um, and make sure that that software can't get any better through that same process. Um, but So that's um, one important concern that we have. And a second one is just the whenever you talk about safety and security, you have to ask for who. And true safety and security in any situation comes from the person worrying about their own security and being able to actually address threats to their security. And too often we're given security measures um, in a lot of contexts that actually are looking out for another entity's security who has control over the user. So you have uh, a car company preventing you from modifying your car because you might make it less safe and sue them if you have an accident. Well, what if you want to go to another car computer mechanic and pay to have extra safety features added yourself, right? That's something you can't do if the system is locked up, and that's something that is in your interest, in your security interest. Or you have, uh, in 2013, um, uh, security researchers wanted to present um, a paper about a, a vulnerability they found that would, in the uh, electronic car key system, that would allow people to break into lots of luxury cars like Mercedes and uh, such. Um, those companies got a gag order against the security researchers to prevent them from disclosing that vulnerability in public. So all of the car owners then were under a security risk that the car companies were not protecting them from and they couldn't do anything about it themselves because they weren't even permitted to know about the problem or modify the software to fix it for themselves. So those are what we think of uh, the, the main concerns that we have when we talk about it. We think modification is good for security and we think that modification is you know, a, a fundamental freedom also in order for uh, to people to be autonomous just as it is in any other free software context. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Foster. I don't have uh, the legal background of, of these guys. I come much more from the free software background, technical background. So. But I think that uh, this forum is really important. I think most of us here are probably software authors or writers or involved in some distro. Um, the safety critical devices, safety critical license SIG, is a great place, I think, for us to learn and to discuss how licenses, particularly copyleft, li strong copyleft licenses, affect our software. Obviously, free software is moving into areas that uh, it hasn't been before, and safety critical stuff is going to be much more important. I don't know how well we address that today. Um, I would expect that this forum and, and this, this SIG would get a lot of cooperation from everybody in this room and, and that's what I'm here today to do, to just exhort people from sort of the Debian duocracy approach. You know, it's really incumbent on everybody here uh, to ask these tough questions. These folks, many of them have, you know, they're lawyers, legal backgrounds, they're not afraid of it. 
So we need to, to start discussing this because it's really, really important and uh, free software is a great opportunity to save a lot of lives. In the United States, I think over 10 years, the last 10 years, more people died in auto accidents than died in the war in Iraq. This is a, a pressing issue and we can make a real difference with our software. So I would expect everybody to, um, to join in here and, and try and come up with some solutions for the best approaches. So, over to you guys, short and sweet from us. Does anybody want to kick off with some participation? Yes, sure. Can, can you speak up? It's really hard to hear. I had a question that came when you talked about the, the current issue where they're going to add features and so on. What about the, the warranty? The warranty? If, if, if the, the user changes, how the manufacturer can be Mm -hmm. um, so, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, right. so the question I think is that if you have a warranty with a vehicle and someone then modifies the software, what will happen to the warranty? How can it remain valid? Uh, so, that's one of the core concerns I think that a lot of manufacturers have. Um, and at least from our approach, uh, GPLv3, for example, says explicitly that you're not required to pr continue to provide a warranty when in a situation where someone has modified the software themselves. Um, um, I, so that's one piece of it, but there's other. Right, you go. I, I used to work for General Motors as a lawyer nearly 20 years ago, and I used to draft warranties, extended warranties, that kind of thing. Um, my view on that is you're right, it's probably void, but changing your software, modifying your software is not any different from using unauthorized parts or parts that aren't covered by the warranty. So why are we concerned that that's different from any other replacement part in a car? Karen, were you going to? Well, I was just going to add to that, that I think that, you know, that freely licensed software is a bit of a red herring yeah. in terms of these issues because, you know, it's extremely naive to think that proprietary software is not modifiable. Um, you know, and, and I think we've we've seen that in the exploits recently, the Prius exploit, which is awesome. If you guys have not seen the Prius exploit, go take a look at it. It's amazing, and it's uh, really effective for advocacy when people say, you know, if we release our software, then it becomes, you know, it becomes less secure, and you're vulnerable to people modifying. It's like, no, no, our software is vulnerable. Period. And so I think that sometimes focusing on the issues related to, you know, sort of saying, oh, freely licensed software is, is, is problematic is, is totally a red herring. I just wanted to throw that out there. No, I think that's a really good point. Yes, um, the problem that I see there is how would you distinguish in the case of warranty between um, something related to your changing the software, whereas some, I don't know, hardware breaking in your mm -hmm. car, like, like a tire breaking. Yeah. Just because it's it's badly manufactured, how would you go about the manufacturer not saying, well, we know that it's about the tire, but technically you change your software, so that voids the warranty, so we don't have to, I don't know if tire is a particularly good example, because that's yeah. probably not by yeah. car manufacturer, but I think you know where I'm aiming at. I do. So take a tire pressure sensor in the truck. Jeremiah, do you want to say something? Um, sure. I mean, there are right to repair laws. So in some instances, you have the right to change your tire on your car. Um, maybe a free software license would also ensure that you had the right to repair the software on your car to make it more safe. Okay. So I don't think it's so cut and dry. I mean, if you vi void your warranty here, that's not that big a deal. You're out a few hundred euros. If you void a 30,000 euro car, that's a big deal and somebody might be willing uh, I think it's very different. I think you might find uh, there's more gray legal area than that. The main area, and uh, it happened uh, because I checked recently, I think it's General Motor who have a problem with uh, their hybrid cars where consuming too much and they upgrade the software all around the world. Mm -hmm. They better emission. And the problem is not the car itself, it's the mm -hmm. insurance to the car. That's what because I was going to say, yeah. It's ah. damage to yeah. other people. And yeah. The yeah. Can go way beyond the price of the car. Yeah. So the insurance company refused to insure that car with the upgraded software. Not, not. Uh, they could. Uh, they, they can manage. 
But there are companies, and you need to be you know, speak for cars. Uh, <coughs> there are companies who are, are, have a certification to do it, mm -hmm. and if you are not certified, you're all closed. And your your warranty is yeah. not only void, but each one is void, so you're responsible responsible for everything. Right. So, uh, so I think what we're saying. Are well, you proof that you change the program in your car and your car is still functioning properly and won't cause an accident? I think there's a much wider, wider class of these issues. So, so, so you're really now talking about the effects of all those cars, basically things you have in the public itself. Um, We've got things quite similar in our country, just both as automotive, with things like pressure, tire pressure, and also like this communication, where you think of GSM network, cert certification is required, uh, not because it's uh, the software is so good. Or can you speak up? I can barely hear you when you're um, facing so, me. So, so, so we've got something quite similar in my company, with, with things like tire pressure gouges, but also with um, GSM software. So the software there is certified and protected and, and legally controlled, not because it's so great. In fact, it's absolutely totally shite. Uh, but it's because effectively, if it goes wrong too badly, you're not taking down the GSM cell just for your own yeah. phone. You're taking it down in, in very large swaths. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't the certification test suite be open then? Right. I so mean, so shouldn't that be the approach? I, I, so I understand. So, so, so we sort of like see something similar sort of like now happening in, in our medical space as well, right? Where we've got two classes. One is like MRI equipment, X-ray equipment, where there's absolutely, as long as the doctor is present, there's absolutely no certain there's no control, uh, doctors modify the software on those devices completely themselves, there's absolutely nothing except when there's something like that, a, a, a nuclear element in there, there's a little bit of it. And then we've got the other class, which is given to a patient, where the patient does something to themselves, which is, which is controlled, like prescription medicine or something, we're all of a sudden, it's, it's certification galore. But in all of those cases, there is that, that effect that you're mentioning yeah. of insurance of that of the commons. So as soon yeah. as you, you cross over in that, I'm damaging the commons, then all of a sudden, even though it may be, be crap, um, yeah. uh, you're running out of software, may have problems. Uh, so I think what we're saying is that there's an issue that we need to deal with in the white papers and it may be that that issue won't be the same across every country and we have lots of people participating from different places and the issues around TVOization I guess where you can't lock down the code there has to be the ability to modify and if you have that ability to modify you're not controlling it by saying that the person who's modifying is certified or authorized by the the car manufacturer or whatever manufacturer it happens to be and that the risks there are that you void your insurance so there's going to be uh, and your warranty and there's going to be questions about diagnostics <coughs> and what we lawyers call causal <coughs> change so showing that something's arisen directly from the impact of changing the software and that the liability and the risk isn't just that you're going to mess up your car and you've lost all your money in your car because it's gone wrong but that there's a safety element here and that safety element means that you're driving a vehicle and if the vehicle goes wrong, I know one car manufacturer has said to me, suddenly the, the infotainment system, the audio system goes loud, you put your foot down, you crash, you kill somebody. You know, there's a, there's a genuine concern for life as well as a financial concern on that whole safety piece. I so, simpler, right? so, so why don't we let a 13 year old uh, uh, drive or vote? Well, because we quite don't quite just trust them as society, right? And in a way, we're sort of like extending this now, like why don't we let someone tinker with their software? Well, mm -hmm. because we don't trust them. Uh, I'm not saying that this is quite justified because the software is generally quite bad, but there is a similarity to between the two arguments. There's an important difference there in who the we is, though. Right, so, yeah, yeah. so this is a, when you start talking about using software to enforce laws by prohibiting all modification of the software, then you get all sorts of nasty side effects. So I wanted to like squeeze this anecdote in real quick. I didn't know if any of you have how many of these, uh, some of the car safety features on the computers you've run into yet. Because I don't have a car, and my when I did have a car, it was very old, so this is all kind of new to me. But they do things like when you start go over five miles per hour, a few kilometers per hour, you uh, can't type on the screen anymore, right? It won't let you. And my first experience with this was when um, somebody else was driving the car, and he just got in it, and he started moving forward and like tapping on the screen trying to figure out why it wasn't working and it almost caused him to hit something because <laughs> 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 he was so distracted so it's you know what seems to be a safety feature can backfire and when you're not able you know when you're locking down an entire system in order to enforce some things that are actually laws and you know, i think we're much better off looking at outcome based tests to verify that whatever's been done to the car it still works you know the way that it's supposed to so just before i take those questions are people comfortable talking about GPL3 and Geneva and decisions around that? Is that something maybe we could discuss a little bit? Because I think that's driven by TVOization, isn't it? 
Sure, I'll, I'll take any responsibility for saying something I shouldn't say. I, I think that <laughs> there's some people on, who are then. cringing in here. Um, I think in general that most car companies would not accept a GPL V3 licensed software module on their car. And that doesn't represent Geneva, I just think that represents most car companies. Yeah, so related to the insurance part, so one thing is indeed what you lose if you change your software, but maybe you can give us a brief overview in, if you know about that, so in which country is it illegal to merely modify the software of your car, for instance? So I guess there are two levels. At one level, you, you do something and you pay yeah. the consequence of it in terms of losing warranty or yeah. whatever else, but in some countries I guess it will be illegal just to modify the thing. This is a great question, and I've asked multiple people who work for automotive companies exactly that and they haven't ever been able to give me a statute that says you cannot do this now whether that's because they don't want to share or haven't in the situations wanted to share it with me whether it's because they don't know or whether it's just lawyers overreacting and you know fussing and saying oh this is illegal um, it's one of the things that instigated this group and these white papers mm. We cannot get the hard fact answers and we're trying to engage lawyers in the automotive sector as well as medical in the hope that if there are genuine and real concerns and actual statutes they will tell us what they are and we will try and help with the development community build solutions that get us around it. I think the, the reality is probably going to be that there aren't any laws prohibiting it but there are internal policies within those companies which may be for very good reasons. And well, that's and laws what we need might to get be general with. liability that right. where you're inter I mean, a part of the problem with our space is that in a lot of the areas, a lot of like licensing, a lot of legal issues that come up as address free software do not have directly applicable case law in common law countries. Yeah. And so we're looking at the case laws and we're imagining how other people might interpret them as it relates to a completely different situation. And that means that some lawyers interpret it one way and other mm. lawyers interpret it the other way. And so, you know, saying what asking show me a statute isn't right. necessarily the way to get the, you know show me a statute, give me a case, give me a line of precedent, show me what you're applying. Because this strict liability piece, which is often what the, the lawyers in those sectors do bring up do have statutes and product liability does have statutes so on the statute side there is a base in terms of applying existing case law yeah it's always going to have to be a bit loose. So about Europe? Yeah, I think, about, I think, I think in Europe if you search for Artemis and Vitus you will find uh, 2012 review of all the European countries is very exact about what statutes Okay, are great. What did you say? Artemis and, Artemis and Vitus. And Vitus. Um, okay. Of course, the answer is very, very unsatisfactory. Because of course, the laws would say like things should be said. You seem to know more about this than any of the lawyers on the SIG, so maybe well, you should so join this it. This was, actually, <laughs> the, this was actually the European Commission, a com a commission piece of research, uh, uh, which my company happened to be involved in. Uh, yeah. Which basically was exactly that. It was only for uh, it was only for automotive. Yeah. And in the end, it only focused on the hard part, which is mm -hmm. tire pressure. You know, yeah. Well, please, no, seriously, please give right, us the, the information, even if you don't join. Yeah, the answer will be very unsatisfactory because, of course, in most countries, that it says it should be safe. Yeah. Right? And then there are all sorts of things which yeah. are laws that are usually very expensive stuff that you have to buy. And that's going to be a question of risk, which is why we need to understand better what the laws are so we can input solutions that help mitigate the risk. Just I mean, at the end of the, the day, oh, sorry, I mean, at the end of the day, if we can't demonstrate the benefits, of freely licensed software in these applications and you know and demonstrate that the fears about them are often unwarranted when yeah. compared with proprietary software solutions then you know those lawyers are never going to make the risk analysis in our direction lawyers no. will all, I, I speak as one uh, lawyers will you know will never say yes they'll almost always say no unless they're pressured or compelled by some business reason to do otherwise. Exactly, exactly. And I think what we need to do is show the value and actually show the solution. Sorry, you're trying to ask at the back there. Sorry. Just one behind you. Um, yes, uh, well, I believe uh, that there could be um, some reasons, different reasons why it would be illegal, as Stefano said, that, to, uh, that it's illegal to uh, modify the software of the car. It could be generally by law, but it could be that if you do it, your car isn't, um, you can't use it anymore in public, uh, yeah. public roads because the certification or what it is is invalid. Yeah. Yeah. So That's it means a good point. That you, be, uh, you are allowed by law to, to modify your, your software, but you have 
to bring it, you can't use your car in a public street. Right. So you are allowed to modify, but not to use the slash. Yeah. yeah. You can have a rifle, yeah. you can modify it, but you can't shoot at someone. Yeah. Okay. That's someone. <laughs> <laughs> so you can sell trade, but you can't use it. Okay. So, and this yeah. is a notion that's addressed also in, in GPL v3, um, because it, you know, I think you have to have some room for that, but it's obviously also something that can be abused. But GPL v3 acknowledges that if, if the modification causes harm to the network um, in some fashion, then you can uh, keep the device off of the network. So there are some analogous things there probably with what we're talking about. So, gentleman in the brown hoodie. Yeah, I, I just want to say that can you speak up a little bit? Sorry, it's just very hard. I just want to say that many of the things we discuss here is it's not a new thing because I think the car has been a very popular object for the application for the the, the dome in the car. So so it have been historically been a mechanical application. But if you go and buy a, a magazine of a car, you, you, in the nineties you find a lot of articles how to um, start to modify the software and then the software start to control the car and if you search on the internet you can find a lot of stuff on, uh, about how to how to how that um, the reverse engineering of the controlling software and things and it's as that's all that's the electronics. There there is chipping your car. You can get a chip and change the fuel mixture, for example, to make your car go much faster. Yeah, so but when your Porsche starts spewing black smoke, yeah. you may decide that that's not a, the greatest thing in the world. But chipping your car is not the same as having free software on the car. I mean, the car companies are the ones who are looking at putting free software on the car. So they have to examine the license and see if it's correct. And, yeah. and if they balk at the GPL V3, when many in the community think GPL V3 is a very good license for the car, what do we respond? I mean, we, yeah. we really need, the free software community really needs to be able to defend the use of these licenses in safety critical systems. So, so that's the question, not, but, but not just the mechanical chipping. But the thing for the um, vehicle authority of countries and for insurance companies, they have dealt with this kind of but it doesn't sound like the insurance companies really understand also the value of safety critical licenses using free software license. I, I mean that. I, I, I challenge it because the trucks is extremely well understood how aftermarket upgrades and trucks and things can enhance safety, reduce your premium. In commercial trucking, there's not a lot of use of Linux. You know, but a lot of that is at the microcontroller level, or there's proprietary, proprietary real-time operating systems. It's very, very recently that Linux is coming into commercial trucking. FMS, there are standards, but those are standards agreed on by consortia. The automakers are very good at working together. They're very good at managing their supply chain, but they're not as good as keeping up at the pace of commercial software. And Linux is coming in there in a big way, and all of a sudden it's GPL v2. So I don't think that the trucking guys know anything about this. No, but that was more and more referring to my colleague here, that, that, it can, that insurance companies understand well that, that aftermarket software yeah. changes can also cause a lower premium. It's a well understood field for them. So there's quite a few sure. people want to contribute, so I'm going to move to the gentleman at the back. I think that's a great idea, great solution. Has it been put forward before? There is a there is a test suite 
uh, underway in Geneva. There's a lot of work being done there, and anything done there will be contributed back to the open source. I think we'll probably need to involve insurance companies, apparently, and government agencies, but I think that's a great idea and should be followed up. Gentleman in the middle there. And that's uh, it's, it's how we, we have some things um, in the U.S., at least like uh, annual tests. You have to take your car in, get emissions testing, right. yeah. get safety yeah. testing, and that seems yeah. like a very, you know, in order to, for your car to be street legal, it seems like yeah. a very good model. Yeah, we have a, a similar MOT in the can, UK. Can we follow up just a quick question? I asked RMS about this, about GPLv3 and cars, and at one point he said that he felt that um, certification and working with uh, the government would be a good way to go. Mm -hmm. can, can maybe the FSF explain a little bit more about the vision of how that would work? Could it be possible mm -hmm. to say lock a car software but have all that source code open to uh, some kind of third party certification body who might review and be able to run the certification and then say, um, you know, I, modify it under certain circumstances or, or, or how would it work? No, I, I think the idea is not to try to enforce any of those rules at the level of just wholesale blocking modification under the DMCA. Um, I think that's, you know, the user needs to be in charge of what's on that system in the end. And then society and the government also, you know, is a, there's a risk to other people, so it makes sense that they are rules that have to be followed as soon as you take that modified um, vehicle out there, but that should be handled through certification <coughs> based on how the car behaves, just like it is for manufacturers <coughs> making proprietary software internally who have to pass standards before they can deploy it. So mm -hmm. I think that's the key for us is don't enforce that at the software level. As soon as you start banning modification, you know, you end up with GPS systems that route you by McDonald's intentionally, um, and you can't change that because if you can change anything, you might mess up your anti-lock brakes. You know, it's um, so. I, I, just, just a, a few people back here have been trying to speak. I'll try and get around everybody. I, I think making the, uh, the test suits available to the users is the right way to go, and I think the user, even if you don't change the software, because in some cases you're even criminally liable to know that, that the equipment you're operating. I don't think you can, I don't know if there's case law, but uh, I don't think you can know with any certainty when you get to the of the software, uh, even if it's certified, that the tests are even relevant to the software. So the, the tests need to be reproducible and you need to add the source to even though if the certificate is, is working. Good point. Gentleman in the hat back there. Yeah, I, I think that free software um, had success in getting started because computers were very new, there weren't many regulations, people didn't really care what was going on. If you asked your, if you uh, were someone who was interested in free software um, 20 years ago, uh, people didn't have water flow systems at their sewage treatment plant or utilities cut hooked up to the public, right? They hadn't heard about Stuxnet, right? People didn't understand how pervasive back then it might have been, but especially today. And so as a result, I think um, individuals and courts probably weren't as affected by this. So now we're talking about free software on devices, um, as Karen was saying, literally inside people or on cars, which cause thousands of deaths. And so I think there are two sort of questions here. Um, how can we encourage and allow innovators to innovate in this field without having to pay a giant uh, bond or, or to associate themselves with a really big institution? Because that's the players right now, the big companies, the corporations. And free software often comes, and new companies often come from one or two people working out of their basement, mm -hmm. uh, the same way Hill Packard did. And so I feel like the market is influenced heavily by existing companies um, and by federal regulations. So uh, the pervasive legal threat um, plus existing market forces seem to make this extremely hostile. So is there some way that we as a community can change the perceptions of that and the you know, legal threat, the, the cost essentially to entry? That seems like the biggest problem. Yeah, I think I would say participate in this group and get these air issues aired in the papers and that are going to go to the policy makers. It looks like there's a, an insurance marketplace that it needs to go to as well as the automotive and we need to try and engage some of the lawyers involved there too, I think. Sure, I mean, I'm just saying based on what I've heard, um, I mean, I don't want to make a, a bet today, but my guess is in one year or ten years, it's still going to cost thousands of dollars to enter that market, if not millions. Yeah, I say that the cheapest way that we've had, we've really made an impact is to support the people who are reverse engineering and showing, you know, in a, in a nice, 
benevolent way the possible exploits with uh, vulnerable equipment that, you know, Barnaby Jack recently died, but the work that he did on pacemaker defibrillators and insulin pumps, you know, was invaluable. Show like the Prius exploit, showing that the proprietary systems are exploitable, and demonstrating where in similar situations you might have a better or at least equal experience with free and open source software is is probably the way to go. I mean, like to me, that has it's so sensational right. that it really sways <laughs> people. Yeah. You sent to that. Yeah. Um, to go on the medical devices. Um, I've uh, run into some issues with the European Directive on Medical Devices. Um, the, the first one is a question from how far is it applicable. If I read it correctly, then it's also applicable for websites uh, that you can use to see if you have a de eating disorder. You just enter some questions and it says your way to light, uh, you have problematic behavior, behavior, so you have anorexia. That's a diagnosis, and as far as I read it, uh, the directive is also applicable to such a website. So I think... Uh, that's, yes. that's really scary, because a study just showed that in the United States, doctors use Wikipedia as their number one diagnostic tool. <laughs> so maybe you want those directives to be applicable to websites. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe you want it, maybe not, but... Um, um, <laughs> When I read it correct, yes, uh, it, the border is really right, and I think many of us are doing things that might be uh, subject to the directive without knowing it. But that's the first thing we we'll went into. And of course, when talking about websites, then you have lots of platform systems. You can't all certify. You can't certify for all browsers that are out there that this site works correctly. So. That's the next problem you went into. But the biggest problem you went into when talking about FOSS is the directive more or less mandates that you have a very strict quality controlled uh, development process. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how to combine that with the way we used, we used to develop FOSS. So I, I really think there's some, some big that's, issues That's a huge issue. When you look at the process of the automotive software development, they are incredibly organized. They have project managers, program managers. They have, you know, almost one-to-one -one manager to developer. And they have very, you know, complete certification and tooling and all this stuff. And in free software, you know, in Debian, it's just a bunch of guys getting and gals getting together and making decisions. So, I, 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 I wouldn't say just the other way around. You know, well, source, our you know, process is yes, our process is very good, but it's different. It's structured it's different. differently, and the the a lot of commercial software folks don't trust our process. Hang on, hang on, guys, one at a time. Back to the no, no. Let's go back to the, the questioner. <laughs> Did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue is not um, who trusts who software between the developers, but it's the lawmaker who has decided for one way to develop that's the correct one. And I'm going to sidetrack it a little bit. I'm working with two organizations in the UK that are trying to do open medicine and share data. So they don't just have the, the medical devices, the um, software to deal with, but they're also trying to deal with consents and uh, individuals' consents to the medical records being shared. They're dealing with best practices and how to put those in an open community and to gatekeep those so that you know the quality is appropriate for people to be sharing the information and not be misled. So it's a complete, it's, you know, it's a great idea, it's a great basis, it's the right thing to do, but on the legal side, it's a complete minefield. Um, you've been desperate for ages. Yeah. Uh, how, how are car manufacturers currently um, proving that the software they provided with the car is still running on a car in case of, of an accident? Or how do you uh, make sure that an update for a pacemaker is not um, malfunctioning or the software that runs it? is not being tampered with by a wireless update or how, how can the can you prove that your mechanic in in your garage doesn't tamper with the software in your car that the gas pedal or brakes don't work or something like that? I can tell you with my medical device I have zero control over the software on my device yeah. and it is 
terrifying, especially since the technicians that update my device are people who have no idea about anything about software. They have no idea that they have equipment that might have viruses on it or, or, or they don't know anything. They've never heard of any of this stuff. And it, it's pretty much every time I go to the doctor, it's a new educational experience as well. And I'm only grateful that I have no wireless component to my device. So at least I know <laughs> when someone is doing, you know, is updating it. So in the implantable devices field, there's no, you know, the, it's, it's all in the hands of technicians who don't, aren't very knowledgeable about software, which I think is a little bit different than some of the other, other fields. But um, I just had to chime in with that because it makes me so angry. <laughs> So for me, it must be um, obvious for the end user. So, like the software in the car has to somehow make itself known that I know which version. If it's open source software, I can I can prove that this is this version running on the on mm -hmm. the car. Uh, if I have a pacemaker that runs open source software, I can somehow check if there was an update done while I was sleeping or something like that. So I I, I want to to make somehow sure that the code is loaded on the chip. Don't even get me started on hardware where you can prove what's running beside the software load on it. But you have to make somehow sure that the software you run on the device you have in your possession is really the thing that says it is. Yeah. We have four people who, one, two, three, four, who are trying to ask questions and we've got just under 10 minutes left. So let's go to the back. Can you speak up? It's really, really hard for me to hear you. And this yeah, is stand interesting. Up, stand up. <laughs> I agree. I've never argued against that. It's a much the open source process is much better, but this is new for a lot of companies. I think we have a lot of legal, uh, legal, legal background to demonstrate, like the breathalyzer cases mm -hmm. and things like that, that demonstrate that when the source code is revealed, that in fact it, it it winds up being improved because the companies that are manufacturing the source code have less incentive to make sure that that, you know, questions that are asked and comments are answered and and things like that. Yep. Yep. Wait. Well, yeah. We should consider things like the, the breathalyzer a safety critical device, right? Not just because of preventing harm to other people, but because you could end up in jail yourself based on the results of a black box that you're not allowed to inspect the source code to. And in the United States, it varies jurisdiction by jurisdiction whether you, you have the right to inspect that source yeah. code. But this is even final, the breathalyzer. I think you need a blood test to yeah. convict it. In Sweden, it is final. And country. if you own a restaurant, you'll lose your liquor license if you're caught driving while drunk. Gentleman in the tie there. Yeah, I think there's an elephant in the room actually here, which is the uh, real life requirements of a procurement officer who, for instance, working for a big utility, who, who is, Stefano here has been involved in a major effort in getting one European country to adopt by default uh, free software. Uh, but the big issue is what kind of uh, uh, backside coverage do I have if something goes wrong? with free software, there's no question in the reality of the life of, a, of, of, the life of, a, uh, of an official in a municipality that with proprietary software he's better off. So I think that is something that is crucial. Uh, Why? Why is he better off? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you already have these things in place, you know? You already yes, have indemnification. What kind of control do you have? Because there's always a way to, sh to, to, to shift responsibility if you're only a vendor or a provider. You can always argue about it. And what about upgrades? You well, know, you, you, you would need to always... That's a business decision, right? Yeah. That's got yeah, nothing yeah, to do yeah, with software and license. That's a business decision under many jurisdictions, trust me. Why? Why? Why is it not a business decision? You can take because insurance. They will always find a way to make you liable if something goes quick for you. No, abso no absolutely not. I, I'm going really to push back on that. So I, I've worked a little bit with the Cabinet Office in the UK. Um, and also in the European Legal Network, we are trying to, and the Open Forum Europe the policy group there, are trying to influence what's happening in Europe in terms of procurement, public procurement, and what's specified in documents. 
and you can certainly in London from Lloyd's of London from brokers there you can buy insurance companies there you can but underwriters you can buy insurance against open source but what people are generally concerned about is IP infringement which you can definitely and I have purchased insurance for in terms of liabilities you might have a maintainer who you're taking the, the liability from because if you're a big utility I doubt very much you're going directly to a small project you're probably going to a systems integrator and that systems integrator SI can take on the responsibilities the IBMs the aggregators can do it so I, I really don't think that's I think it's defeatist it's possible and I, I'm seeing it done so there was just there um, yeah so I, I, I have one is a, a, another way of approaching the issue of, about automotive and, and changing the way of thinking. Is um, a lot of these car companies they outsource their development for hardware and software at least partially. And I know, for example, one company in Belgium, the Alexis, is quite big in sensor development. So if you approach these companies, they're, they're a little bit smaller. They have their own ideas. They experiment with their own things. If you approach these companies and, and present that idea of changing the way open software is embedded, uh, that's probably one of the easier ways to get to, to the companies because they already have these companies. Um, also, there's a, uh, a second thing. In Belgium right now, they're talking about um, having the option for police to be able to stop cars from a distance, uh, adding some kind of hardware in the car. It's still, um, well, it's no, in, in Europe. It's, uh, that sounds really dangerous. <laughs> sounds scary. And it sounds very scary when there's no control or there's no real, like, who's going to make a decision on that. That's also a very scary thing. On to your first point, I think that going to the small companies and talking to them about open source is a good idea. However, when you start climbing up that food chain of the automotive suppliers, you get to the bigger ones, a lot of them rely on proprietary software. So that's where the real trouble is. I think that the big companies, you know, the, the car companies, I think they're very interested in it. I don't think they have any problem with open source. They want to be up to date, like an Android phone. But you get lower in the food chain, that's much tougher. That's just been my experience. Anything you just want to go ahead? Yes, uh, I believe that there is a um, uh, technical solution, at least in part, for your problem about the peacemaker. At least to know what is, uh, this device is doing. Um, because having the source code, providing the source code, uh, you, you don't want to risk to compile and to upload your, your binary and to risk. But um, there was a talk this morning from Luna, from the Debian project, about reproducible builds. <coughs> so, uh, having the source code from the render, uh, you can rebuild the, the, the binary, and you can, could uh, verify if that binary with a uh, reproducible build is the same as the, the one on your device. So you're sure, okay, you know, this is the software, you can control the software, having the source code, and you know what this device is That doing. sounds great. Can you talk to Medtronic and get them to give me the source code of my device? <laughs> you should have it. But it's, if you ask your source code for your device, maybe it's, it's uh, easier this way then so to and upload your own oh, no, well, sure. I mean, I, 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 and this is a distinction that I find that is necessary to make when explaining the issue to medical professionals, too. I mean, I, you know, when I want to test the source code, I don't necessarily want to actively test my device <laughs> while it's in operation. <laughs> and people say, oh, you want to modify the source code on your device? You're crazy. You're like, no, I, I want control over the software of my, you know, that, that my life relies on, but I don't necessarily... You know, anyway, it's it's really interesting, but that's they're, they're sort of a separate. I'd like to be at the point where you're, you know, you're commenting. So, I think we have one, two here. We have two minutes, so you guys need to be quick. Okay, quick. Um, I'm uh, having a little hard time seeing the incentive for a commercial company to uh, move to uh, FOSS in safety critical devices. So it shouldn't probably be the angle where we're approaching this from more be like the policy makers and the legal <laughs> or no. okay. A software license is a business agreement. 
that's all you're doing. I mean, these companies can use soft, this free software and this license and just go and make money. It's, it's not, we need, we need it's not both. a problem. We need pressure from the public and we need, we need yeah. to demonstrate that proprietary software is over time less safe than free and open source yeah. software. Yeah. Of course. We, we really, sorry, sorry, we're really running out of time in this one last... Yeah, so just a quick comment. On, on critical devices, I think we might be tempted to say it would be cool to have the software even if you cannot change it. But I think that's, that's actually can make things worse because if you think about security, having the source code publicly available to everyone but not being able to change it is actually worse because everyone can, you know, review, find more, uh, arguably more easily security issues, but then when you know about them, you cannot fix it. So I think we should, for critical devices, we should go, you know, all the way down and go have all this free or software freedoms that we need, meaning access to the source code, ability to redistribute change and so on and so forth, and not stop midway. Because well, right now it's completely messed up. Worse. Right now it's completely messed up, right? There's of no course, security absolutely. built into my device. It's broadcast, you know, well, mine isn't, but, you know, generally they, they are. And, you know, and the code is proprietary, but, yeah, the, totally but there's I'm no security. We so we need, we need real security. We need, you know, yeah. Okay, so we need to wrap up. But thank <laughs> yeah. you very much to the panel <laughs> and you. thank you to the room. Thank you, guys.